Thank you very, very much uh, for joining our webinar this morning. Uh, my name is uh, Daniela Munene, and I'm the CEO of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. Um, and we are bringing this series of webinars to you uh, called Pharmacy COVID-19 Dialogue, because we want to find out what pharmacists are doing to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic at their places of work. And so we are um, featuring speakers uh, from various areas of practice. And uh, this is our third webinar uh, in this series. Uh, initial, our first webinar, we had Professor Ndemo, who is a chair of our COVID-19 task force, giving an overview of how PSK is responding to the pandemic. Uh, and we also had a speaker from the KU Teaching and Referral Hospital. In our second webinar last week, we featured a clinical pharmacist from um, Joe TRH, uh, who gave us their perspective of what they're doing there. Uh, today, you will see uh, 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 an array of speakers, uh, you know, who, who you will uh, find out what they are also doing in their facility. We also have lined up a webinar where community pharmacists uh, will tell us what they're doing. Um, uh, a coming webinar as well is on uh, policy perspectives, where we will feature speakers uh, from the Ministry of Health and from the Pharmacy and Poisons Board uh, to present to us uh, the policy and regulatory perspectives in responding to COVID-19. Uh, we will also, uh, in a subsequent webinar, uh, feature uh, uh, experts in manufacturing um, and distribution so that they give us those perspectives in terms of supply chain, in terms of, um, uh, you know, expanding local manufacturing. And so if you have an expert opinion in any area of pharmacy that, that can um, add value to this COVID-19 uh, dialogues, please reach out uh, to the office we are looking for speakers for, for future webinars. And so I would like you to go to the next slide, uh, Peter. So I'll introduce you to our moderator for today. If you could go back, Peter. If you could go back to the moderator. Um, so our moderators are usually two, but today we only have Dr. Mike Mungoma. Uh, so Dr. Michael Mungoma is a member of PSK. He's also the Dean School of Pharmacy at Mount Kenya University. He's a member of the PSK uh, National Executive Committee, which is a committee of the Council of PSK. And he's also a member of the PSK COVID-19 uh, response task force. Uh, so, Dr. Mungoma, um, Karibu Sana. Thank you very much. We, we usually have Dr. Sylvia, but today she wasn't able to make it. So, for today, uh, Mike will moderate and I'll be your host. Uh, over to you, Mike. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Thank you for coming this morning to this webinar. This, as was mentioned there by Dr. Daniela, is part of, this, of a series of webinars that uh, PSK is hosting, uh, showcasing and just sharing our experiences with COVID-19. So before we get started, there are a few ground rules. Participants are muted during the entire session of uh, the webinar. Uh, please ask questions through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your window for the Q&A. So questions will be addressed by panelists later in the program. For PSK members, if you haven't done so, subscribe uh, for this webinar on the PPB portal for today's webinar so that you can get your CPD points. The webinar is being recorded and an audio will be made available on the PSK's YouTube page. So on to our speakers today. We have a panel of three speakers 
way labeled speakers, very experienced pharmacists. Our first is Dr. Yakub Sheh. He's a clinical pharmacist specializing in critical care, Mombasa County. Graduated from the University of Nairobi and practices in Mombasa. He has also served as a chair and council member of the PSK Cost Branch and represented the branch in PSK National Governing Council for the last six years. He's also a member of several professional organizations, both locally and internationally. So he's currently a member of the PSK COVID-19 Task Force and chairs the PSK Case Management and Infection Prevention Control Committee. Welcome, Dr. Yakub. Thank you, Mike. Our second speaker is Dr. Jonas Makori. Dr. Makori is the Chief Pharmacist, Cost General Teaching and Referral Hospital. He has specialized in pharmacoepidemiology, clinical trials. He's also an honorary lecturer at Technical University of Mombasa. He is a member of the International Society of Pharmacoepidemiologists as well as an active member of PSK. He's a pharmacist and holds a master's in pharmacy and pharmacopedemiology and pharmacovigilance from the University of Nairobi. Thank you. Our third speaker is Dr. Faith Wangasha. She's also a clinical pharmacist as cost at Coast General Teaching and Referral Hospital. He has a postgraduate master's in internal medicine and critical care. So master's in pharmacy, uh, specializing in internal medicine and critical care. And is a passionate believer in pharmacy beyond dispensing. She's a team leader in COVID-19 response of the Coast General Teaching and Referral Hospital. So I want to welcome all three presenters. And I want to move on to our first presenter, Dr. Yakub, to take us through his presentation. Thank you, Mike, for having me. So I'd like to welcome you all to this presentation. And uh, we'll be sharing uh, the experience we've had so far with dealing with the pandemic. So just as an introduction is that pharmacies play an important role as active members of the healthcare team. And uh, we are also fully integrated in the pandemic planning and uh, response towards this uh, COVID-19. Not only do pharmacists have an effective role in clinical settings, but they also play an important role in the community by making the drugs available, enhancing uh, infection prevention and control awareness among the public as well as colleagues. And uh, they also play a role in policy decision making at the ministerial level, at the county level, and uh, assisting guideline development in, uh, at several stages. Next. So on the 19th of March, the FIP, International Pharmaceutical Federation, released a guideline to clarify the required information about COVID-19, which pharmacists need to know. And on the 30th of March, uh, PSK initiated a COVID-19 task force with uh, specific terms of reference to respond to the pandemic, as well as prepare a series of pharmaceutical sector guidelines and uh, so that pharmacists can be can be trained and be able to to deal with the pandemic. So, the president's initiative, the PSK president uh, formed five PSK committees, uh, and uh, several key stakeholders were involved, including universities, the Ministry of Health, PPV, Cambry, Kenya Association of Pharmaceutical Distributors, HOPAC, Kenya Pharmaceutical Association. Uh, county governments, this includes uh, the county pharmacists and the sub-county pharmacists, the teaching and referral hospitals, as well as, as, well as uh, the PSK members. So 
if you look at this uh, task force and all the subcommittees, they all sort of feed and augment what the ministry is doing as well as what the private sector uh, is doing. So this is just a, a slide showing you uh, all the, the subcommittees which were formed. Resource mobilization, training and public health education, case management and infection prevention and control, supply chain management, as well as risk communication and public relations. And all these subcommittees meet on a weekly basis and uh, they provide a feedback to the main task force and uh, whatever is generated or whatever feedback is, is achieved is also communicated to the, to, the, to the ministry as well as other stakeholders. Next. So let's go to the case management and uh, infection prevention committee. So this committee in, incorporates uh, several senior as well as uh, young pharmacists, not only those uh, who are working in the hospital sector, but also in, in different sectors such as community, those who are working in uh, faith-based organization, as well as those who are working in uh, uh, NGOs and uh, the regulator, as well as the Ministry of Health. So this committee involves, I mean, uh, it is formed by uh, Dr. Ndinda Kusto. We all, I think we all know Dr. Ndinda Kusto. She's, a, she's a one of very vibrant pharmacists and uh, working with MSH, Dr. Evelyn Wesangula. Uh, she's a senior, senior pharmacist, head of uh, infection prevention division in the Ministry of Health. Dr. Christabel Kaemba, also a, a specialist pharmacist in pharmacovigilance, works in, the, in, in PPB and also assists with the COVID, uh, I mean, uh, committee in, in the Ministry of Health in, in, in generating the the guidelines. We have Dr. Ruben Mogoy. Uh, he's a clinical pharmacist working in Aga Khan University Hospital, Nairobi. Dr. Esther Nyango is a clinical pharmacist intern at MTRH. Dr. Peter Ngovio, Dr. Hilary Kagwa. Uh, Dr. Hilary Kagwa is also the vice chair of uh, HOPAC. Dr. Mandeep Soki is a community pharmacist. Susan Jogu is a pharmacovigilance specialist working in the ministry. Previously, was, she was working with uh, Afia Ugavi and Dr. Lucy Njogu, a community pharmacist. So previously, before I became chair, we had Dr. Bon, uh, we had Dr. Njuguna, who was uh, the, the, the committee, I mean the committee chair, who was working uh, in MTRH. Next slide. So, the objectives of this committee is to, um, mainly three, and one of them is to regularly update PSK members and other healthcare providers on credible drug information for management of COVID-19. Secondly, is to evaluate scientific literature on investigational medicines used in COVID-19, as well as generate treatment protocols and uh, the, the, the society's position statements about certain therapies which are being used. And lastly, is to enhance safe use of medicines in COVID-19 patients, as well as enhance uh, patient outcomes. Next. So one of the things which we have done uh, initially, because we, we, WHO had, uh, had announced this uh, disease as a pandemic on the 11th of March. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the FIP on 30th of March started issuing guidelines so based on this and uh, on uh, WHO's recommendations, we came up with a position statement as a society on the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine. We all know this uh, is one of the drugs which became so famous after the US president's mentioning that people should start using this drug to treat uh, COVID-19. So what we factored in in the position statement is the WHO's recommendations issues regarding ethics, uh, full disclosure of information to, uh, to patients with regards to this uh, medicine, it being a, a trial therapy and the possibilities that it could work or not. And also with regards to issues of the adverse effects, issues about uh, uh, clinical outcomes as well as uh, any ADRs with regards to this drug. So, 
Factoring all those, we, 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 we compiled that and uh, put those, put our own PSK recommendations and uh, forward it towards not only just the PSK members, but also to our fellow colleagues in the medical field. Next. Then after that, we set up informing uh, an essential medicines and supplies list. And this we generated and uh, issued on, in April. And uh, in this list uh, document, we, we mention about the trial medicines which are being used and those which are readily available in our market. That is hydroxychloroquine, the, uh, initially lopinavir, ritonavir, and uh, tocilizumab and the like. Then we also mentioned about adjunctive medicines which are being used in the management of uh, COVID-19. That is your NSAIDs, your antipyretics, your cough medicines, and uh, antibiotics and the like. And uh, for management of critical care patients, we also mentioned about uh, the medicines which are needed in ICU settings. That includes your inotropes, your, 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 your IV fluids, your, your, your strong antibiotics in patients who have secondary anti, I mean bacterial infections. We also mentioned not only just medicines, but also parapharmaceuticals and PPEs and all those uh, medical supplies which uh, uh, we need in the, in the hospital settings so that we can be able to deal with, uh, with the COVID-19. Next. So if you look at uh, worldwide, the, the number of medicines which are being investigated, the number of trials, there are several, and uh, it's approximately 548 drugs which are being used. And uh, from these five, 548, you can, you can, if you look at that graph there, you'll see that 167 are antiviral therapies. Then we have 142 vaccines, and then other treatments which are also being investigated are 239. So in total, we have a lot of medicines which we have to look into, to skim through, to analyze, and to uh, recommend to members which therapy can be used in our settings. And not only do we look at conventional medicines, but as well as the, the herbal medicines as well. Next. So that is a list of some of the medicines which have been uh, investigated and there's at several, I mean, different phases of, of trial, some at being at phase four, some being in, at, at phase three, some at being, being at, at, at phase one. And uh, 176 of these are clinical compounds and uh, 372 mostly are, are preclinical compounds. Next. So, this slide basically shows you the different uh, therapies which are being used and are being investigated and uh, the different phases which they are in. And if you, if you look at that slide, it just tells you that uh, most of these are, are still at the initial phase, that is phase one and phase two, a bit uh, slightly more on, uh, I mean, in, in phase three and very few at, at uh, phase four of, of, of uh, trial. So the other thing which we do as a committee, which we've come up and developed is uh, a pharmaceutical care and therapeutic management guidance of uh, COVID-19 patients in Kenya. And uh, this is an official document which has been generated by the pharmaceutical side of Kenya. And we hope that it's going to be rolled out maybe by the course of the week, or if not, then early next week. And uh, what we've factored in in this particular guidance document is from is just on pharmaceutical care, and uh, it is to augment whatever the ministry has already generated, and so, sort of not duplicating whatever the ministry has done. So we look at screening and triaging guidelines, uh, home-based care of patients, uh, management of mild to moderate uh, COVID-19, uh, severe COVID-19, as well as we've looked at uh, patients who come with uh, comorbidities such as 
uh, diabetes and uh, hypertension. So uh, in the course of uh, next week or, uh, or, or thereafter, I think we're going to, to be rolling out uh, this guidance document and we'll be having a series of uh, webinars and we'll be inviting uh, the, the heads of each section to be disseminating this to the members. Other than that, uh, I think we've, we've held several webinars and uh, we've looked at several aspects of COVID-19 in terms of responding to this uh, pandemic. So one is we've, we've, we've discussed uh, community pharmacies response, what they can do, what are they supposed to do. Then uh, we've looked at uh, masks because this has been a pertinent issue about use of, of, of uh, the N95. So most people didn't understand uh, what an N95 stand for. And uh, we wanted to also discuss about the other masks which can also be used in cases where these N95 are, are not available. Then we also looked at uh, the COVID-19 trial therapies. And although we did not factor all these medicines which have been discussed earlier, yeah. but uh, we looked at those which were, which started, I mean, those which were bubbling up and uh, those which are, have been, are, are currently in use and are being tried in, in major trials across the globe. Then we also discussed about intensive care preparation and uh, what critical care pharmacists need to know, mm -hmm. as well as uh, this discussion wasn't about just pharmacists, but also uh, our nursing uh, colleagues. And uh, another presentation which we had made is about herbal, herbal medicines. We all know about the COVID organics, which uh, was being uh, uh, promoted by the Mozambique, I think it was in Mozambique, right? If I'm not mistaken. So it, it generated a lot of debates and uh, we wanted to just clarify and uh, uh, discuss what is it really a therapy which can be used or uh, or not and in case of we ha we have other herbal medicines which can be tried out then what 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 do we need to factor in uh, before we say that this medicine is actually working Next. yeah thank you it was in madagascar not mozambique so Let's go to Mombasa and I'm going to share the experience uh, we've had so far in Mombasa. Uh, it has been uh, raining COVID in Mombasa, as you all know, and uh, one of the, uh, what do you call it, villages in Mombasa, the old town, was under lockdown. And uh, as you can see from that picture, you can see this, this, the, the, the town is deserted. Then. Uh, from the series of webinars we've had and uh, the trainings we, 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 we did with our members is that they had to prepare themselves uh, to deal with the pandemic. If you go to the next slide. So we, we started to look at uh, whether the recommendations we, which we had made were actually being, being implemented by, by our members. So we did an impromptu visit uh, in some of the pharmacies and one of the pharmacies uh, we visited is, was Makadara Chemist. And uh, we sort of looked at what had they prepared. And uh, one of the things that which I was impressed is that uh, they were actually 99.9% uh, prepared in, in terms of dealing with this pandemic. So if you look at that slide, they had already shared uh, to the public the timings because of this uh, lockdown. I mean, uh, the, the timings had to, had to differ and then with the curfew with regards to opening and closing and then with regards to giving information to the public about washing hands, about not touching the face, the mouth, the, the eyes and the, and, and the nose and issues about social distancing and uh, staying at home if they are feeling unwell. Next. Then again, we looked at whether they were actually doing the hand washing and the hand sanitizing and uh, sanitizing those surfaces which were, I mean, the highly touched areas, the, the cupboards, the, the, the doors and the, and the the working bench. So from that, you can see uh, 
the, this particular pharmacy was, was uh, well prepared and uh, they were doing their part. Next. Yeah, so that is the pharmacist in charge of Makadara chemists, Dr. Hussein Ganiji. And if you look at his uh, pharmacy, you can see the front bench, he has put a uh, glass there. And uh, he has also put markings on the floor to maintain social distance. And he's also, I mean, the, 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 the staff have also worn uh, face masks. And uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll be able to see. Uh, next. Okay, the next slide. So, yeah, this. So you can see that the different, I mean, the distance between the patients who are visiting in, it's not crowded and uh, they are well standing on, on, the, on the markings on the floor. And uh, even, the, even the patients themselves are, are actually wearing masks. So it, this was one of the ideal pharmacies which I, I saw, which we needed to share the experience with. Next slide. Again, if you look at outside the pharmacy, I mean, the queues, uh, there's distance uh, between the people who are waiting to be served in, within the pharmacy. And uh, again, this is one of the preventive measures uh, against this uh, pandemic. Next. Yeah, so I went to visit another pharmacy, Malibu Pharmacy. We have Dr. Elizabeth there. And uh, how she prepared herself, uh, you can see there she's put some, uh, she's cordoned off the area and uh, she's put a, a hand sanitizer and then again, paying is by M-Pesa. And uh, one thing she mentioned is about the highly touched areas because she also deals with patients who are, uh, uh, have insurance. So they have to identify themselves using the, the, the fingerprints. So uh, one thing she mentioned is that she has she she always sanitizes after every every use of of that of those devices, and uh, she's already cordoned off the area so that there's distance between uh, herself and the patient when she's serving, and it's clearly stated uh, as you can see that the esteemed customer keeps social distance. Next. Again, this is the counter, the front counter, and you can see where she, uh, the distance and the, the cordoning off of that area. And there are also uh, the Ministry of Health uh, poster with regards to COVID-19, how to, how to prevent the infection in the community. Next. Yeah, so the other thing is also not to touch or lean on the on the working bench, and I think that was also being displayed there, and uh, the 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 posters from the Ministry of Health. Next, the other pharmacy I visited was uh, Shifakem. This is one of the pharmacies which we had uh, initially accredited for Green Cross, and uh, you can see there from the outside, Askari is. Uh, taking the temperature and is fully uh, done with the face shield and the face mask and there's distance in the, uh, um, between the, the customers before entering the pharmacy. There's also hand washing facilities in case of those who, are, uh, who want to wash their hands. But the other thing I also saw is that they also do hand sanitizing. So they've placed both uh, uh, hand washing facilities with soap and uh, they also do hand sanitizing next. So inside the pharmacy, uh, they've sort of cordoned off the area and they've also put on the, I mean, they, 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 they put on the markings for where the clients should, should stand. And uh, if you look at the staff, they are also uh, wearing the, the face shields and the face mask, as well as having their hand sanitizers on the working bench. And uh, one thing I, I, I saw also is that they, they, are, they usually frequently wipe the, the working bench with, uh, with the hand sanitizers. Next. So on your right, you'll see Dr. Rawia, who's the pharmacist in charge in the retail section. 
she's fully gowned and uh, with an N95 and a, and, a, and a face shield ready to, to serve a client there. And then again, the, the distance and uh, between the patients and the, and, the, and the people serving the patients. Next. Next. So the other facility we visited was Aga Khan Hospital uh, Mombasa. And uh, we, this is what they had to share. They've placed a, a glass uh, barrier between the pharmacist who's uh, dispensing the medicines to the patients in that uh, uh, dispensing uh, room. And uh, you can see there they, they, they are fully equipped with the hand sanitizers as well as the face mask and the patients are already wearing the face mask. The other thing is they put a poster uh, asking people to uh, hand sanitize as they enter and uh, there's distancing uh, in the seating arrangement as they wait to be served in the, in the pharmacy. This is uh, Coast General Teaching Referral Hospital and uh, the ladies you see in front of you are the most uh, Active ladies, I can say, the deputy chief pharmacists of, of course, General Hospital, Dr. Rafida and uh, Dr. Payal. And uh, they are fully armed with uh, the trial medicines there and uh, the hand sanitizers. And uh, one, one thing I was impressed with, uh, course, General, is that they are actually manufacturing their own, their own uh, hand sanitizers. It was a bit of challenge. I mean, they had their own challenges with regarding to uh, testing whether uh, the hand sanitizers which they are, they are making actually meet the standards. But I think this is, was uh, work in, in process and uh, they, they are involving uh, cabs to, to check for quality of these uh, hand sanitizers they are, they are making. Then again, if you look at uh, the distancing on the seating uh, outside uh, the pharmacy where the patient needs to uh, wait to be at, uh, served. They've clearly put on the markings so that uh, the social distancing among patients who, who, wait, who are waiting to be served. Next. Yeah, so this is their casualty pharmacy and uh, you can see there Dr. Mahmoud and uh, he's uh, clearly uh, lowered his uh, glass window so that uh, to avoid those aerosols which can come from the suspected patients is the is the weight and they are fully armed again with the with the hand sanitizers and their face masks. Next. So we actually asked these pharmacies which we visited and uh, wanted to find out which products were uh, fast moving and these were some of the products which were reported initially and. Uh, some of these, uh, these products include antibiotics such as azithromycin. Uh, another pharmacy uh, also mentioned uh, uh, amoxiclav among the antibiotics which are fast moving. Then uh, vitamin C supplements. As you can see there, on, I took a picture of one of those shelves and they are fully uh, armed with those uh, drugs. Uh, mouthwash, masks and uh, hand sanitizers were among those drugs which were uh, which were fast moving initially, but as as the as we progressed on, I think uh, most of them are, are mentioning that now the consumption of some of these products is is uh, is reduced, and uh, mostly uh, patients come for just uh, masks and uh, just uh, uh, hand sanitizers. But uh, most of them, it's it's reassuring to to know that the patients are now aware. Because initially they were just stockpiling and uh, preparing themselves for the worst. And even uh, some of their chronic medications, they were actually stockpiling uh, anti-diabetic medicines for three months and, and so on. So that they can, they can uh, prepare themselves in case uh, of a lockdown. And then they are assured that uh, they have the medicines available in their homes. Next. So... What we've discussed, now I'd like to focus in the, on the frontline pharmacists in Mombasa and uh, just to mention the different roles they play. Dr. Yaku, so please summarize. Is... Please summarize. We are running out of time. 
Yeah. So all those uh, uh, are the pharmacists uh, who are in front line. And if you go to the next slide, again, those are the sub county pharmacies and those uh, pharmacists who are in the private sector. Next. So what role do they play? Uh, the county pharmacists and the sub county pharmacists uh, play a role in budgeting and setting up the COVID treatment center. Uh, management of COVID uh, health products and technologies, including PPEs, the viral transport media, the swabs, etc. And uh, they also report to national government about these uh, commodities and they also handle donations. They have uh, different experiences and I would wish if PSK could give them an opportunity to also share the experiences. It would be an eye opening for, for the pharmacists who are in the public sector to know what challenges they face and uh, how are they managing uh, with regards to those challenges. Then uh, we also have the beauty of Mombasa, we have uh, four pharmacists who are uh, sub-county MOHs and uh, they've been playing a huge, huge role in terms of uh, quarantine, isolation, contact tracing, which is a big headache because we have more than 2,000 or rather 5,000 uh, people who are being traced uh, in terms of coming to contact with patients who are, who are COVID positive. Then again, health promotion, uh, talking to the public, uh, uh, issues again, again, issues about IPC. And then when it comes to hospital pharmacies, they've been focusing on having uh, the trial therapies available, monitoring these therapies, uh, telepharmacy, because you know we cannot, we don't come directly into contact with these patients. So we we talk to them over the phone, uh, ask them how they're doing, whether they have any allergies, whether uh, they have any symptoms which are debilitating, and uh, so on and so forth. So the other thing uh, I think uh, is to the the hospital pharmacist, and here we have Dr. Corid, who has played a big role in setting up the COVID unit uh, within CGTRH. And uh, I think she's already made several presentations on this. And uh, the other thing is uh, continuous professional development. Next. So other things which we have already, we, which we are doing and we are continuing to do is uh, we are doing radio interviews, talking to the public, uh, engaging them through social media and uh, training uh, community health volunteers as well as Red Cross and colleagues on, on uh, infection prevention and control, issues with regarding to hand wash, is, issues with regarding to, to uh, home-based care of, of uh, COVID patients and so on and so forth. Which medicines are they supposed to be using? Which are, are they not supposed to be using? What are they supposed to do in case uh, uh, a patient starts having symptoms and so on? We also have meet, we had a meeting with the Senate Health Committee members and gave our PSK recommendations together with the PSK president. And uh, the other thing is we've started to attend the Ministry of Health COVID-19 Steering Committee meetings, which the PS chairs. Next. So my parting shot is that when you can't control what's happening, uh, challenge yourself to control the way you respond to what's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Yakub, for that uh, very rich presentation. I think there's quite a lot uh, that uh, is happening and that you're doing. And it is very good that you're also represented in some of those committees and linkages so that the pharmacies out there can be also seen to be responding to COVID-19. So without waiting, without wasting more time, I will uh, just move on to Dr. Makori. I know we are pressed for time, but uh, Dr. Makori, go on. Thank you so much and welcome on board everyone to share our experiences on what we are doing on the ground. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, just a brief introduction. We all understand that uh, with the COVID-19, there's a lot of disruption in the entire healthcare system from the routine services that we over normal circumstances, suspension of some of the services, 
in terms of the number of patients who are visiting hospitals, we're hearing of uh, facilities that are almost sending the health workers home because there are no either in patients or patients. The same scenario also happens in uh, public hospitals, it's not an exception, because some of the services were suspended for some months. Then there's a strain in the human resource capacity where we have to divert some of the human resource working somewhere else to work in the isolation units. And also a strain on the supplies. It's a lot of consumption when it comes to the PPEs. Even some of the items that are not normally on our formula list or postcode list. Then this issue to do with the revenues. There's a drop in the revenue corrections. That means funds have to be allocated from other sectors or other uh, allocation to cater for the increased number of patients. As you may well know that Mombasa, if you take uh, the cases that have been identified, we actually have the highest incidences of COVID-19 compared to other areas like uh, in Nairobi. And uh, Cold General is one of the largest treatment centers. We have a bed capacity of 150 beds for moderate and severe patients, while our technical university has a capacity of over 100 beds for mild cases or asymptomatic cases. Uh, that also has an impact on uh, our stock status of commodities. As we had, there was a rush for patients who want to have their prescription filled for two months, three months, or four months. We are not prepared uh, in filling those prescriptions for a longer period of time. So we have to adjust how we are doing our orders, how we are dispensing, and how we are doing our budgeting. Then the disruption in the supply chain, and I'm going to talk more about that. Next slide. Now, this is a common picture we normally see in our setting. On my right-hand side, we have clients who expect to, get, to receive their medications. And when you are checking your stocks, you seem not to have sufficient stock to get up for you. I can give an example of what happened initially about a month ago when actually even healthcare workers could not want to work because there were no face masks. We have a population of almost 1,000 members of staff. At any given shift, if you take half of those staff to be on duty, that is almost 500. For each member of staff supposed to have uh, at least three masks in a day, that is almost 1,500. Remember, like surgical mask, it was only used to, we used to use it in, uh, in theaters. Not everyone in Osco used to wear uh, such home masks. So with the increase in demand, it puts a lot of strain in the entire supply chain. Next slide. <clears throat> now, in terms of supply chain, a few months ago, we had a number of countries, especially the Asian countries, India, China, putting some restrictions on exports of uh, commodities, and supplies they normally use for COVID-19, including drugs, uh, the PPEs, diagnostics, uh, for a very long time. Uh, last week, we had an issue with the testing because there were no reactions. And this is a reality that we have to live with and adjust and accept that there will be challenges during pandemics. So we need to prepare as pharmacists who normally deal with these commodities so that we are not caught awares and awares about these challenges. Next slide. Next slide, Peter. Yes, how are we dealing with some of these challenges in the supply chain? Uh, one of the things that we've said uh, we've done is setting up a supply command center that is headed by one of the deputy CEOs. What this command center does that when they reach a decision that they need to procure then the authority to procure does not take a prolonged period of time. We know in government setup, there's a lot of bureaucracy in terms of uh, procurement. It may take months even before you get an item, but with the supply command center, everything can be done at an instant because the person who is in charge or is on top of that command center is a person who has all the authority and all the information uh, and can be able to redirect and direct resources when and where 
it is required. So what we've done that any uh, recommendation that is given by the disease surveillance team and the COVID committee, action can be taken appropriately without necessarily having delays that we normally experience. Next slide. Uh, the second approach is trying to manage the supply chain at risk proactively. Uh, this means that as a team in the proc uh, procurement pharmacies, we are among that team in procurement, you have to identify, assess, and prioritize the risk so that you can plan well in advance. You, you don't have to have this issue of uh, firefighting. You want something, is not out of stock. I can give an example. We all know that KEMSA, when it comes to the end of the financial year, around 15th to around 20th, they normally close for 20, uh, 10 days for their annual stock take. So if you need an, an item in KEMSA that you need to plan well in advance to make sure your orders are processed in time before they officially close for their stock take. Next slide. Then another uh, strategy that we've taken is creating resilient supply uh, chain webs. Uh, and in this sense, normally, uh, most of us in government, we rely on a single supply, maybe, maybe cancer. Would it be appropriate at this time to have two or three suppliers so that you can have a bit of diversification? Normally what happens in uh, processing orders, from the time you start processing an order, to the time you raise a requisition and send to a supplier, because of the demand, you may find that an item that was in stock, by the time they're receiving your LPO, the item has been taken by another customer. So in those circumstances, we need to have second option and third option, and it should be flexible enough to be able to manage these instructions. Next slide. Another option of, of coming uh, these challenges is coming up with home based innovative solutions. And one of the you know, uh, innovations that we came up with is that we are doing our own hand sanitizers. Before we started making these sanitizers at the onset of the pandemic, we were spending almost 1.5 million just for hand sanitizers. But when we started making our own sanitizers, we reduced that cost by 70%. Actually, the savings we made from the sanitizers was allocated for pharmacy and improvement of the infrastructure. Then we developed our own criteria for evaluating our sanitizers, both using the organoleptic uh, properties and also analysis. Although there's still room for improvement on this front, uh, we need the sanitizers to be approved by GAPS, it's a bit of a process, but it's an opportunity uh, for pharmacists and for hospitals. And then it is more sustainable than uh, procuring from the suppliers long term, maybe setting up a small manufacturing unit within the, our pharmacies can be more assured and more sustaining going forward. Next slide. Then another challenge in uh, common management is dealing with donations. Our leaders are getting donations from many countries, from many partners who are willing to support this war, uh, the pandemic. But we have challenges with product validation, quality of the products. On the ground, we may not have the capacity to actually validate the product that we are receiving from the PPEs, from the non farm uh, and the rest. And again, we have the urgency of using these uh, commodities. We have no time to really validate. Then we do not have cap uh, sufficient capacity on the ground to evaluate some of these technologies. We have had issues with, to do with the test kits and so on. But as a country, do we have those technology and capacity to have those verification done. So what we've done as an institution is to establish 
a very robust inspection and acceptance committees, encompassing the user department and other technical staff to ensure that at least we can be able to verify the sources of these uh, donations. Next. Next slide. Then there's an issue of management of uh, the formula list. Which evidence should we go for? There are so many publications. Every other day you go to the net and find what is in COVID management. There's a lot of information. Which information do we trust? Because even clinicians themselves cannot agree what treatment to, to give. One can be for option A, another one can be uh, of option B. Like an example of uh, HCQ, there was a paper that was even written by very real journals. But we need to be very careful about the bias of researchers and the interest of the pharmaceutical industry. Everyone will like to push for their own, their own agenda. So you need to make your own judgment. You need to have a team that is able to investigate uh, the evidence that has been given so that we can come out with facts that can be applied in our settings. Next slide. Next slide. Then in relation again to management of the formula list, there are a lot of choices that have been put up. There are a lot of drugs that are still at different levels in clinical trial, as Jacob mentioned. There are more than 530 drugs at various stages of uh, clinical trials. But as an institution, you may not uh, have the 500 or the 200 drugs that are still under investigation. You need to come up with what works for you in your institution setting, what is available, and what is best for, for your patients at your own setting. And most importantly, that for all these drugs that are under investigation, we need to keep sufficient information, not only about the medication, but about, about the patients who are using this medication. We've dedicated three clinical pharmacists to our isolation center to capture all this information as we read the guidelines from the ministry and from Pharmacy uh, and Poison Board on how to go about uh, this medication that are still in clinical trials. You will find that there is a very big uh, off rebel use of this medication. Like a drug like uh, Femectin, they recommended, uh, recommended a dose for COVID-19 in some countries like Australia is 10 times the issue of dose. So how do we monitor for possibility of adverse drug reaction when you are giving 10 times the issue of dose? That is what has been seen working in some countries. So we need ready to document and follow the outcomes. Next slide. Then for our staff, we have a lot of psychological issues for members of staff who are in the front line uh, providing uh, the services. Any new pandemic creates Fears, I mean, we are just fears, and members of staff need reassurance from time to time. They need to have the right knowledge, effective communication, so that they can be able to put uh, adequate precautions against this uh, disease. We had a scenario, I can talk of a scenario, of a staff from isolation unit that who could not be staffed at one point because. Everyone, when they see someone from isolation unit, is seen as a staff who is already been infected. So if members do not understand that in isolation units, there are areas that have been called, uh, coded red zones, there are areas that are coded green zones, they will really make harsh judgments about other members of staff, and they will really have and their risk of fears about this COVID-19. We encourage our members to stay informed, but not be overloaded, over flooded by information. If you look at the newspaper these days, the majority of the frontline news is about COVID-19. And majority of the news is not good news. It's news that spreads a lot of fear, takes away the, the hope and the confidence. 
So we need to encourage our members to save the information that they're taking in so that they can only make use of information that can help them in terms of the precaution and in terms of management. Next slide. Yes, I've alluded that the media is flooded Summarize. with information. Kindly, I'm moving fast. So we encourage members to stay informed, but also make time for themselves. Do something that you like. Don't all, uh, all the time spend your time, maybe on the internet, looking for COVID-19 information. This live from COVID-19. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, always remember to have resilient structures in place. We've overcome epidemic before, many epidemics before. We had the Spanish epidemic, we had HIV epidemic before. And really, people have managed to overcome these uh, epidemics. Don't let us not be prophets of doom. Let's be prophets of hope, encouraging others in whichever way we can. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, and most important in psychological coping is always having a plan. Yes, COVID-19 is with us, and we have to learn to live with it. Imagine if one of you or your family member uh, had COVID-19. What are the plans you have in place? Where could you go for isolation? We've had stories from isolation centers. Would you want to go to that isolation center? Or could you want yourself to be quarantined somewhere else? So you need to have those plans ready, just in case anything happens. And lastly, you need to know to when look for professional help when you are overwhelmed by either sadness or depression. Always seek for advice, seek for help from a, a professional body or person. Let's move next. I, I will not repeat what Yakub had gone through, some of the strategies that we put in place in terms of protecting the staff and the clients who visit our facilities. Uh, uh, this is important for pharmacists, that pharmacists need to come on board and be part of the research team. Uh, currently in Coast General, there are two studies that we are taking part in, although both of them have not begun, but we've submitted the documentation. And one of the biggest studies is the Solidarity Clinical Trial for COVID-19. And this is an international trial trying different uh, treatment options. And uh, of yesterday, the trial had enrolled about 3,500 patients in almost over 100 countries and over 400 hospitals across the world. In Kenya, I think there are three hospitals, KNH, MTRH, and also Coast General. So the Solidarity trial is being headed by WHO and the partners. Then the second trial is looking at the clinical epidemiology and immunological patterns of COVID-19 across Kenya. Uh, it is being added by researchers from the University of Nairobi and the partners. We've also submitted our papers for approval to be included in that clinical trial. And uh, three of our pharmacists, including myself, were involved in this trial. Next. Thank you so much for giving me this time. Thank you. Uh, I think there is quite a lot there that uh, we need to learn. And uh, I think we're also very impressed by our involvement in even the most recent uh, trials that are ongoing globally. And uh, that one of us is also part of that team. So I'll move on to Dr. Mwangasha, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask her to be very, very brief. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. So I'll give you 10 minutes. Please try and just uh, uh, summarize your presentation. Thank you. Dr. Faith Mwangasha, are you there? 
Yes, I am here. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, please start. Yeah, I'm going on already. So, well, as it is, I'm the last speaker. So I will ask everybody else to listen to me without bias. Uh, well, uh, mine has to be brief, as has already been said. And uh, I would just like to give a preamble saying that it was an honor for me to have been appointed to head our, our, our pharmacy response. And uh, I want to share my experience as it has been in the realest way possible. I will ask the moderator to just keep on scrolling down the slides spontaneously because uh, we are just running, we are doing like a quick run. So in, our, um, in my job description, a job description that I had to come up with in the shortest time possible, I, was, um, I commissioned myself to prepare a list of the drugs and uh, medical equipment that we were going to require for the COVID-19 response. I must say that this list was just uh, a, a list that we prepared on a tentative kind of uh, way, knowing that it was going to be revised from time to time. Now, the list included the main antimicrobials. You could move to the next slide. Uh, the auxiliary and the supportive uh, medication, the intubation and theater medication, the emergency and crash tray, and uh, the most importantly, of course, the drugs for underlying conditions. We know that COVID-19 has a propensity for being a, a bit harsh on people who have underlying comorbidities. So when you're treating COVID-19, of course, you need not to forget the the underlying comorbidities. And of course, the last one was the non-pharmaceutical equipment and supplies. Now, after we have prepared this list, we needed, of course, to see how best to, to forward this uh, equipment and the medications to the isolation unit. As uh, has been said earlier, there was a lot of misinformation, a lot of fears among staff members, etc., regarding how we are going to dispense to this particular unit. Could you move to the next slide? And that way, we decided to come up with the paperless initiative. I'm calling it paperless in that we tried to adhere to the MOH guideline of keeping a minimal movement of paper from the isolation unit to the other areas of the hospital. Of course, it has been a process that has uh, ha had its own hiccups and challenges, but I'd like to say that uh, so far, so good. Uh, we are trying our best to rectify the various uh, mishappenings, the various disjointed uh, communication, and I can say we are doing great. Uh, now, if we could move to the next slide, please. The other point number six there is where actually pharmacy needed to come in strongly. You know, after dispensing all these drugs, we still needed to own our products as it were to ask. So after dispensing, how did these products fare with the patients? Did they achieve the intended purpose? And here we came to the next slide, please. We came to the rational drug use in COVID-19. I would like to stress that even though COVID-19 is a pandemic, you know, everybody is just doing their best shot, we still are the stewards of medication and as stewards of medication, we cannot just ignore our responsibility, especially as regards antimicrobial stewardship. We are not just going to use antimicrobials as though they were, you know, as though they were sweets. We needed to have a guidance, even if we were just making it and remaking it as a, time went on, I would like to say that we have, uh, we as the pharmacy department have been uh, at the forefront, you know, in owning our products. As such, we have identified uh, various areas of interest, like uh, antimicrobial therapy in COVID-19. We want to ask, is this antimicrobial therapy indicated? Is it effective? Is it safe? Does it afford patient compliance? And I'd like to say that it has been very encouraging seeing everybody coming on board, you know, from the person dispensing to the person utilizing, asking all these questions. And number two, we have the role of vitamins and uh, mineral supplementation in COVID-19. Like, is it improving on the hospital stays? Uh, does a patient do better with the zinc supplementation and uh, vitamin C supplementation other than antibiotics? You know, we are asking very hard questions there. The anticoagulation therapy, the PPIs and the antacids, and of course, the analgesics and inflammatory, if I could have the next slide. Yeah. 
Yeah, the rational drug used in the intubation is usually an emergency. It's usually a very tense moment. And uh, over here, the pharmacist has a very cardinal role to avail the medication required, avail it in the, the right quantities, because uh, you don't want to start an intubation process and have to cut it short because there's no morphine, because there is no atracurium, you know? That kind of thing cannot happen and should not happen. You know, the use of vasopressors, you know, vasopressors like noradrenaline, they're usually, you know, very critical situations here. And uh, I would like to commend our pharmacy department for its presence of mind. And, uh, you know, we have been very awake to these realities, the challenges of comorbidities, as I've said, the challenge of advanced age. And newly, most newly, we have seen a lot of surge in the pediatric COVID-19 patient. So this is where I'd really like to dwell on the matter, because this is where the crux of pharmacy practice comes in. As I said earlier, it is pharmacy beyond dispensing. You know, so after the dispensing, we have endeavored, if we could have the next slide, we have endeavored to collect as many case reports as possible to try and analyze how this, uh, whether, the, whether our dispensing was actualized, like did it achieve the best role? And uh, uh, if it did not, what could have been done better? So as it is right now, we are in the process of compiling our case reports and we hope we'll be able to share soon. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, I think I'll just have to go to the last slide because now I am closing. PTA really had to rush through, but I think the last slide really um, summarizes what I want to say. Like we have had uh, the privilege, quote unquote, of having been the pioneers of the COVID-19 response in Kenya because Mombasa has been one of the hardest hit parts in Kenya. And uh, as it is, we would like to, to have the privilege of sharing our experience with everyone else. So basically in a nutshell, the way I've summarized it, it was coming up with the list. Uh, ensuring that the dispensing was done comprehensively and uh, safely. And thirdly, of course, we are going on to champion for the um, rational drug use and uh, those the topics that I have identified. And I would like to say that uh, we would like to be given another chance later on to be able to share what our case reports have revealed in a, in a bid to set an example for other departments, other pharmacy departments nationwide. So I think with that, I will have to. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Faith Mongasha, for uh, getting it done in 10 minutes. Apologies again for rushing you through your presentation. I realize that uh, there's quite a lot there that would have been expounded further. In fact, for me, I think I'm really interested in some of the points that you have uh, pointed out there. There was a slide there with about four or five points of exactly what you're doing. And just looking at your profile again, internal medicine, as well as, uh, let me work with the other thing here, internal medicine and critical care. We will definitely bring you back here and give you uh, a lot more time to give us even case studies because that is, I think, now what we are probably going to get into, getting very, very specific. And uh, I, I want to go again now quickly to some of the questions and answers. And the first question, I think, is to Dr. Mwangasha. Yes. This is from uh, Dr. Neto Bala. He asks or says, what a timely presentation. A question to the panelists. Regarding the paperless approach, you have you considered using a software for prescription, uh, for prescription preparation and examination requests? Uh, if I could answer briefly, please. Yes. Yeah, we, we are in the initial stages of using a software, a standardized software, but as it, the challenge is training everybody else, and uh, as it is uh, in place of that, we came up with a quicker initiative than that was using my WhatsApp number. 
let me just uh, share it in the realest way possible. I just offered for people to use my WhatsApp number where people would send for me screenshots of the tea sheets upon which I would uh, analyze them and, uh, you know, have a bit of dialogue with the prescriber to see exactly what they mean, to see exactly whether we have alternatives. And I would forward the same to uh, to the pharmacist uh, on the ground. So in this regard, we tried our best to keep it as anonymous as possible, knowing that this is a delicate record. You know, we're still bound by ethics to honor our clients. Yeah, so far so good. Thank you for that response. Uh, the next question, I think I'm going to direct it to Dr. Makori. This is from Chris Masila. Good work in Mombasa County and engagement by pharmacy practitioners at community and hospital pharmacy level and the local hand sanitizer, CPGTH, is great. First question is, are the pharmacy professionals working hand in hand with the lab teams in public and private for COVID testing and care linkages. Two, how is waste management of PPEs being handled at pharmacies and hospitals? And three, is there any local mask production in Mombasa? Thank you, Chris, for those questions. Uh, the first question, whether pharmacies are working with uh, other members, especially the lab. Yes. yes, pharmacy is represented in several committees, right, from Infection Prevention Committee, IPC Committee, the Clinical Management Committee. We have a representative in all teams that are managing uh, the, the COVID-18. Two, in terms of waste ma management, uh, all the waste, including the mask that we use, the PPEs we use are treated as highly infectious products. So they are insinuated in guideline uh, with how highly acidous substances are insinuated within our facilities. Then in terms of local production, currently I do not know of any local manufacturer of uh, uh, face masks in Mombasa. We are still importing from Nairobi and uh, beyond maybe it's an opportunity for, for the pharmacists in the county. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, another question here to Dr. Mwangasha from Dr. Farida Chakera. What is the expert panel's inference on the use of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine usage in suspected patients and positive patients. Wow, now I would answer that question from uh, evidence-based practice. Uh, in the earlier times, we have just been using azithromycin paracetamol as the baseline for all our COVID-19 suspected cases and also confirmed cases which were deemed stable. We have restricted the use of HCQS uh, largely to cases that uh, maybe had um, underlying comorbidities or the cases with advanced age. And uh, I would like to point out that in most cases, when people were started on HCQS, it was stopped midway when the other antibiotics were seen to be doing quite okay. And, uh, but in some two cases that I remember, HCQS was successfully used and the patients actually were discharged successfully. But concomitant use of azithromycin Mycin and HCQS, that one has been discouraged. And uh, there was a, in the early times, eh, I noticed there was a T sheet with both azithromycin and HCQS. And I remember pointing it out to the clinician who obliged to remove uh, the, the azithromycin as they were initiating the HCQS. Uh, we had just uh, done that uh, in light of uh, you know, the danger of potentiating the, the QT interval prolongation. So, in summary, that is what I can say. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll probably need another forum to get into uh, greater details of that one. Uh, there's a question here to Dr. Yakub from Dr. Gaja. It is more of a comment, but it's, uh, I think there's a question in between, so you could respond to it. So she says, you mentioned a role for the county pharmacist 
and sub-county pharmacists in terms of budgeting, management of EHPTs for COVID-19, reporting to national government ETC. Do you not think that under revolution, they have an independent role with respect to providing policy guidance within the county to offices like the CEC Health, the governor, as well as coordination of advisory roles on pharmaceutical policy, including pharmaceutical care. Dr. Jacob. Thank you, Mike, for that question. And uh, I think uh, it was revolving around devolution and uh, health being a devolved function. I think that was her question, if, I get, if I, I'm getting it right and uh, whether there's a role about uh, with, with regards to the Ministry of Health uh, providing these commodities, I mean, EHPTs to, to the counties. Remember, this is a pandemic, and uh, with, re with regards to our situation, and uh, we all know uh, we are in a resource-limited setting, and uh, we needed some help with regards to all these commodities, or, or EHPTs, I would, I would mention, and uh, we got this help majorly from the ministry because all these uh, grants and uh, and uh, funds are coming from the international donors are coming through the ministry of health they are not coming through through counties so definitely ministry of health has a huge role to play and uh, them being the ones distributing these commodities or ehpts uh, the, 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 the role uh, the, the counties, county pharmacists are playing is more of uh, showing transparency with regards to the use of EHPTs. So yes, the counties, the, the governors have a big role to play and they have done, but uh, the resources are limited and we have serious uh, financial constraints and challenges and we do need help as through, through many partners as, as possible. So whether it's coming from the Ministry of Health, whether it's coming from uh, NGOs, international donors, well and good. But uh, all this has to be accounted for and has to be in a transparent manner and reports have to be generated. That's what I would, I would say. But uh, I think this question would be well answered by the county pharmacists. And as I said, mentioned earlier that uh, uh, we, if we can give the opportunities to these, uh, all these frontline pharmacists I've mentioned so that they can also share their, their experience. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Yacoub. Next question is doc to Dr. Makori from uh, Frederick Givinji. So thanks, Dr. Makori, for the good practices. How have you tackled the challenges of funds management in procurement? We all know in government, this is one of the biggest hindrances in the procurement process. Thank you for that question. Uh, one thing I can mention about management of funds, whether in an epidemic or normal circumstances, that we need to adhere to the procurement and disposal regulations it is not an exception. So if you are required to have quotations, if you are required to float quotations, you need to have all that in place. It will not be an exemption. And I can tell you for sure, uh, funds like uh, this one for epidemics, they'll be audited more deeply than any other normal funds. So we try as much as possible for all the procurement laws to the extent that we can manage. The, but there's always a provision where you have some emergencies to the limits at which you can procure without following those uh, uh, procurement laws. But it must be done within the procurement laws. What we are located, that one we cannot control because we make our requests. Depending on what is available, that is what we are given. So that much we do not have control. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We have another question here to Dr. Faith Mwangasha. <clears throat> Clinical question. I think you are going to be a focal person when it comes to some of these webinars. How, this is from Stephen Gichana. 
how do you reconcile safety of medicines in patients with COVID-19 and co comorbidities like diabetes mellitus and hypertension considering you are not directly in contact with COVID patients or their files? Well, wow, thanks for that question. Uh, I would like to say again, the paperless initiative has really been instrumental in allowing us um, the chance to analyze uh, you know, the, the treatment protocols of patients, even from a distance. You see, when the, when the doctor sends uh, the, um, the screenshot of uh, such a T-sheet, and maybe you can trace uh, the, the medication that has been given there, from the, the medication repertoire, you can almost tell that this is uh, underlying diabetes, this is underlying, uh, you know, maybe there's another one who actually had underlying PAD. So I would like to say that um, the paperless initiative has really come in to, uh, to deal with that problem. Have okay. I answered that properly? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Uh, we have a comment here by Emma Kivuva who says, She's very impressed by the presentations of the presenters today, Dr. Mongasha, Dr. Makori, and Dr. Yakub. Um, the other question is to Dr. Makori. Are you able to routinely check the alcohol content in the manufactured hand sanitizer? Uh, as I said before, uh, this is an opportunity for all of us. Checking for alcohol content is not very difficult. The equipment in the market, known as uh, alcometers, that you simply dip is like a thermometer and it will tell you the alcohol content of your preparation. Or you can equally do an analysis, but for analysis, you cannot do it in our setting. Because you know our pharmacies the way they are, they are made. But for procuring an alcometer, it's very easy, straightforward. So it can be done in uh, a pharmacy setting. There was another question I want to respond to. Someone had asked about uh, how they can be involved in uh, the clinical trials. Now, clinical trials are very, uh, very controlled trials. Not every institution that take part in this trial. There are a number of considerations that they take in place. One, that you must have a human resource that is capable of conducting a clinical trials. And remember, clinical trials involve teams from the physicians, people from the lab, microbiologists or pathologists, the pharmacists, and all the other cadres who have been involved in the research. Then you must have people who are trained to conduct clinical research. You must have a, a training in clinical research. Then three, you need to have the numbers. You cannot set a clinical trial where you will, have, you will have no numbers. For example, this clinical trial for the solidarity is because Mombasa has uh, one of the highest cases of COVID-19. So they must select areas where you can get sufficient uh, participants and sufficient samples. Thank you, Mugoni. Right, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh... Now, I, I, I'm looking at um, most of the other questions I think have already been answered. Um, at this point, again, I want to say that we clearly have very able members in the pharma sector who are... Dr. Mike? Uh, yes, Dr. Yakub, you wanted to say something? I, I can see a, yeah, there's a question there by a guy, someone called MIA2 mm -hmm. asking about... Uh, have we thought of a herbal therapy? So okay. uh, maybe just to, ma to, to answer that. Uh, well, we had uh, the ministry, the, the Ministry of Health uh, mentioning that uh, Kemri uh, is, is working on uh, trying to, to use one of its uh, compounds as, uh, as a therapy, but uh, all in all, all herbal therapies have to because considering they are, they are trial medicines, they have to also undergo uh, clinical trials. So they have to be registered under the board and they have to 
follow all the protocols which other conventional medicines are also going through. So all in all, we cannot uh, just uh, pick a herb from the, from the, from the forest and uh, start uh, compounding it and giving it to our COVID patients. We have to follow uh, the, the ethical issues and uh, make sure uh, all uh, regulations are met so that uh, patients are, 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 are protected as well. Yeah, thank you for that. I think clinical trials is quite a burning issue when it comes to COVID-19. We have had uh, quite a lot even in, in, in the media regarding whether certain antivirals are working or not, whether hydroxychloroquine is sometimes in, sometimes it is out. There are also, uh, there's, there's also progress in the front of trying to get a vaccine, which seems to be a focus. Uh, by certain countries because they believe once they get the vaccine then they don't really need to treat people you know once you prevent something from happening then uh, maybe the focus shifts from treatment to just improving lives but again we have the experts here dr makori has already mentioned that uh, the, the the institution is involved in some clinical trials and it's quite rigorous just to get into this in the first place, as well as uh, produce results. We must appreciate that um, the public as well as professionals want answers and they want the medicine to COVID-19. That is something that we must appreciate. But I think this is something that will take some time and that will require concerted effort, not only just in clinical trial settings, but as well as information gathering and sharing which is the forum that we are currently uh, in at the moment. So again, just to remind you, what I'd mentioned earlier is that one, uh, this webinar has CPD points that are going to be awarded. I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, pharmaceutical technologists and other cadres that are probably present in this forum. You can claim your points from the PPB portal as part of the requirements for you know your annual subscription and your annual registration and renewal of licenses second uh, psk covid 19 uh, response task force was set up to respond to some of the issues there that members have in the pharma sector as regards uh, covid 19 and we have a small kitty where we encourage members also to contribute something towards some of the efforts that we are doing. We know the circumstances that are prevailing at the moment. And as an institution, as a society, we have to keep going to continue serving members as well as continue uh, contributing towards not only COVID-19, but many other aspects that we continue doing as PSK. So at this point, I think I want to uh, uh, say thank you because I'm looking at the time. I want to thank the three presenters, Dr. Yakub, Dr. Makori, and Dr. Mwangasha for the very rich presentation and very stimulating uh, presentations that you've, uh, you've done so far. I think we are going to call you guys again because personally, I don't think I've had enough. Uh, second, I want to say thank you to Peter, Dr. Peter Odiambo at the back. He was very good and smooth and seamless in uh, ensuring that the slides move. And also thank uh, uh, Dr. Sylvia, who, who was not able to be here, my co-moderator. But of course, she was part of uh, the building up to, to this. And uh, thank the CEO before handing over to her so that she can close this webinar. CEO, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, Asante Sana, Mike, for, for keeping time, <laughs> managing the time so well. Uh, Dr. Daniela? Yes? Maybe before you close, I'd just like to mention something I forgot because we, we mentioned about herbal medicines. We also do have a herbal medicines committee, which is headed by Dr. Elizabeth Ogaja. 
And I hope she's going to be given an opportunity to also discuss all these uh, herbal therapies with the members. Yes, definitely. Thank you. For that clarification. Um, Dr. Ogaja, we would love to have a session on alternative therapies uh, for COVID-19 uh, because that's one of the focus areas of the PSK COVID-19 uh, response task force. Uh, Dr. Louis Mashogu, the, the president of PSK, if you could just uh, say a word or two before I close the meeting. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Uh, uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, really wonderful presentations. And uh, um, I mean, as PSK, we are, we, are, we are available to support even more knowledge sharing across all, you know, whether it's sub-county, county, and even teams, whether even in private sector, uh, faith-based. So we are, we, are, we are the platform to avail that in the pharma sector. So thank you, Daniela, for this. Haribu sana. So members, please look out for all the COVID-19 dialogue series on our YouTube page. We always upload our webinars on our YouTube page. Um, have a good afternoon. We'll see you next Wednesday. Bye. Thank you.